Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors, where with the countdown to the NBA Finals at one day, we are absolutely thrilled to have the host of NBA Countdown, Jay Williams, here to talk to us about watching basketball like an analyst. We'll learn what analysts look for when they're watching games that we're watching as fans. We'll learn what kind of work he's doing throughout the uh, the NBA playoffs and finals to be ready for games so that future sports broadcasters know what's in there for us. And we'll make sure we get a pretty good appreciation for how we can better watch and uh, appreciate these upcoming NBA finals. Now, in basketball, it's frowned upon to talk back to the referees. And if you yell back at your TV, that kind of makes you seem a little bit crazy. But today, uh, we want this to be interactive. So we want you to talk back to Jay as much as possible. He's going to ask you some questions. And you can use that chat panel to uh, the right of the video there to answer those. And you can ask him questions. And at the end, we'll interview Jay with all of your questions. Tag your name on them so we know who's asking. And while we've got one of ESPN's biggest on-screen, on-camera superstars here, we want to put you on camera as well. So have a camera nearby. And at the end of class, we'll take a selfie with Jay. The winner, when you post it to Instagram, tag Jay and uh, tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win an autographed basketball that we'd love to send out to you. So, all right. As his final appearance, I think it is, before the NBA final start, at least before that day, um, Jay's generous enough to uh, to give us a ton of his time and talk about basketball. So I want to introduce you to your teacher for today, Jay Williams. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. Hey, everybody. How are you? Uh, very excited about what we have to break down today. Obviously, the analytics of the game are something that I pay heavy attention to. And also, you know, one of the things I wanted to do for you guys is really break down how we see the game. You know, a lot of time casual fans get a chance to sit there, you relax, you got your Coke, you got your, your Pepsi, whatever brand of drink you have, and you're just relaxing, right? You're talking to friends, you're talking to family. Uh, whereas when I watch games, it gets pretty intense because I'm just not paying attention to the slam dunk. I'm not paying attention to the crazy three, you know, the Jamal Murray arrow. I'm paying attention to the nuances of the game. It's my job to tell you why they scored or why they got to stop. You know, I know we live in this vacuum right now where, you know, with some of these measurements, it's like, hey, well, I'm going to tell you who's going to win by how much. Let's be honest about it. Um, unless you have inside detail about a team, it's hard to tell who's going to win depending upon how many factors are actually involved. So, look, it's my real job to get into the grit, into the grind of how basketball is played. And it's my job to tell you why something actually happened after it actually happened. So just give you guys the true meaning of what it means to be an NBA analyst. So let's kick things off with we'll, we'll go through what we're going to talk about today. And Brian can put things up, you know. So the first question I have for you guys is why do broadcasters still get the best seats at the games? That's a question for you guys. I want to hear your feedback. Tell me what you guys think. And uh, let's kick some things around. I like it. TV has never been more crisp or clear, which is very true. Um, okay. I'm liking some of the answers we see. Uh, let's see what's going on with the players. All right. Yep. To tell the story of the game. Smart. All right. like that too. Yep. Ah, interesting one. I like that. To give you insight into what the players are doing pregame. Smart. All right. So, Let's break this down real quick. Um, obviously, we're living in a very different world right now. 2020 has been an insane year. We actually, you know, we weren't allowed to be at games at first, but we do have a broadcasting team that is there. It's my job to be in studio. But one of the things that you pay attention to when you're on the court is you actually get a chance to see and feel how big, fast, and strong some of these individuals are. So what I did, because I want to put this in perspective for all you guys, I am six, two and a half, six, two and a half. I weigh 198 pounds. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty strong here, but Yao Ming who got drafted over me. So, you know, a lot of people just to really break down basketball talk, a lot of people are like, well, you were the third pick or you were the fifth pick and all this stuff. Okay. I was the second pick in the draft. I'm six, two and a half, 198. Yao Ming, who's standing next to Shaq to your far left is 7'6", 310 pounds. 7'6", 310 pounds. Standing next to Shaq, who is 7'1", 324 pounds. 
So you then see a picture of me, the first pick in the draft, Yao Ming, next to myself, who's six, two and a half. Now, when I stand next to normal people in everyday life who are 5'9", 5 5'8", 5 5 6 feet tall, they're like, whoa, you're really tall. Just understand how fast people are. Is Jay that tiny? No, I'm actually not tiny. I'm, I'm larger than the normal average human being, but compared to the people I'm playing sports with, I am tiny, okay? Now let's think about some of these, these other athletes, LeBron James, 6'9", 250 pounds. You know who else was 6'9", 240 pounds? Carl Malone. You guys may not know who Carl Malone is for it's all my young guys out there, but He's a guy they called the mailman. He played with the Utah Jazz back in the 90s, and he played with a guy named John Stockton. It's considered to be one of the best pick and roll combinations the game has ever seen. So Carl Malone was built like this. So now take a power forward. He was a power forward back when he played. Now take that same size and put that into a point guard built mentality, and you have LeBron James. Luka Doncic, 6'7", 230 pounds. He's a point guard. You see him with the Dallas Mavericks. Stephen Curry, he's probably really small, right? No, Stephen Curry, 6'3", 190 pounds. And then the last one, Chris Paps Porzingis, right? He's a guy who sets screens. He looks a little bit tall, looks lanky on the court. 7'3", 7'3", 240 pounds. Think about what people say. Well, he needs to put on weight. He doesn't. He's 240 pounds at 7'3", and can shoot three. So... One of the things you see when you're courtside, guys, is you get a chance to see LeBron James at 6'9", 240 pounds, goes down the lane like that, flies down the length of the court like that. So we used to do this challenge when I was in college. I would have to count how long it took me to make my way all the way down the end of the floor. It would take me around three, one to get down. So one, two, three. I was crossing the line. I was all the way down the court. So you have a lot of guys that are that fast, that are that strong. You also have guys like Zion, ready? Zion, 6'6", close to 300 pounds. Zion, 43-inch vertical. A 43-inch vertical. There are times when you want Zion jump where his head is above the rim, above the rim. Now, you guys may see that on TV, but you're also sitting back watching TV from back here, right? When you're on the court, you get a chance to see how quick guys move, how fast, how strong they are. So I just want to put that in perspective and it allows you to tell the game differently because you have a firsthand experience at breaking it down. Plus you also see how guys move on the court and how the court looks so much smaller when you're there because these guys are such big entities on the floor. Okay, let's go to the next slide. I think that was a great breakdown just to give you guys a comparison. So who sees what? TV shows you the ball, the score, the most exciting highlights. A lot of you guys are on social media. Brian, please keep this screen up for a little bit. A lot of guys are on social media. You guys see you know, the Instagram highlights. You guys see all the things on Snapchat. You guys see the storylines and narratives on Twitter. That's not what I look for, okay? What I look for, what an analyst looks for are what are the key matchups before the game? What are those matchups? How are the coaches adjusting in those matchups? What sets, what plays are these teams running? Movement away from the ball. So matchups, we have plays, we have movement away from the ball, and we have adjustments and mismatches. Okay, Brian, let's come out on the screen here. So here's a couple of things, okay? A lot of times the nuances of the game are things that win games. We're on the eve of the NBA Finals, okay? Let's go back to the, NBA, let's go back to the Eastern Conference Finals. What we saw was Brad Stevens, one of the best coaches in the game of basketball, play, uh, actually coach against Eric Spolstra, who was one of the most brilliant minds in the game. I don't know if you guys saw, but Miami was playing a 2-3, two, 3-2 three, three, two zone. They would switch it up depending upon where the guy was at the bottom of the zone, okay? We had a hard time. The Boston Celtics had a hard time beating a zone. But what you saw throughout the midst of that entire game. So you guys are, oh, they're playing zone, right? So think about it, you're watching a little quick of a highlight, like they're playing zone. You don't really know if it's a two, three or it's three, two. You're just like, they're playing a zone. Do you know how many times that defensive scheme changed? Do you know that Eric Spostra, 
the coach of the Miami Heat went from a 2-3 to a 3-2 to a box and one to a triangle and two to a matchup zone, back to man-to-man. -man. He did that multiple times throughout the course of a quarter, of a quarter. You would never see that because you're paying attention to the ball. You're paying attention to it's Kimba scoring. Ooh, that was a nice move by Kimba. Ooh, what a shot by Jason Tatum. But you don't see the multitude. Multitude actually means the, uh, the amount, right? A, a, a huge amount of different coverages and schemes that were put into how you guard things. So let me break it down another level for you guys. There are these things in, in basketball called scouting reports, right? So I'll give you, this is a hypothetical example. 45% um, of the shots Kimba Walker makes off the dribble finish with his right hand. Now, so what does that mean, All right? Close to half the shots that he makes off the dribble, or I'll give you a better one, say 70%. 70% of the shots Kimball Walker takes, hypothetical once again, 70% 70, 70 of the shots Kimball Walker takes off the dribble, his last dribble is with his right hand. Now, let me tell you why little things like that, the nuances of the game are so important. This is the analytics part. I recognize that when he takes his last dribble with his left hand, with his left hand, he has a 70% chance of missing that shot, pretty much right? 30% of making it because that's not his comfort level. His comfort level is 70% of the time he finishes his dribble with his right hand, he's taking that shot, right? So he's probably making that shot. So there are little schemes that you see. So just because they're playing a zone, if the shot clock is dwindling down and you're in a one-on-one -on -one isolated situation with Kemba, if you are in a zone, you're funneling him towards help. But if you are in a situation where you're playing him man to man, you want to force him to go left at the end of the shot clock because he doesn't feel as comfortable taking a shot with his last dribble being in his left hand as opposed to if you make him go right, he's going to feel way more comfortable because he can pull up with a higher percentage of making those shots off his right hand. So these are all the things that you end up getting on a full list of scouting report telling you here are the amount of plays that they run, here are the quality of shots that they take from the right side of the floor as opposed to the left side of the floor. Hey, LeBron James loves a spin move when he attacks the rim. One of the things you guys should pay attention to when you get a chance to watch the Miami Heat versus the Lakers starting tomorrow night on ESPN, ABC, by the way, just a shameless plug right there, is whenever LeBron James drives, most of the time, LeBron James drives and he spins. There's a drive and there's a spin over his right shoulder. There's a spin. That's his go-to move. It, it's probably around 60 to 70% of the time he gets in the lane. When he drives that ball with his left hand, he is going to spin over that left shoulder and wants to come back to his right hand. Now, it doesn't mean he can't finish with the left hand, but if you understand scouting report and you see that he does this the majority of the times he attacks the lane, then all of a sudden that gives you an advantage when you play against him to a degree. So if he's driving me left, I'm going to jump on the left hand and I'm going to try to have him turn back into my big who recognizes what the scouting report is, who is waiting for LeBron James to come back to his right hand, and then we can meet him right there collectively together. So those are the, some of the nuances that you see and how I actually view the game. One of the other things I pay attention to in viewing the game is, does a player seem ready? One of the things they don't tell you about when you go to watch a game, I don't fly in on the day of the game. I fly in the day before. I come to the gym early. I see who gets to the gym early. We're allowed to talk to the coaching staff. Time, Doc Rivers just got fired the other day. I can't tell you how many times I spent time with Doc the day before the game, going through what the scouting report was, going through what that team is trying to accomplish when they play the Lakers the next day or when they play the Utah Jazz, Donovan Mitchell. And then I also get to pay attention to how was the practice? Was it spirited? Was it competitive? Did Kawhi Leonard look lazy today? Did Paul George, was he making a shot? Knowing that maybe Paul George is struggling from the field, was Paul George shooting the ball better the day before practice? And then taking all those nuances that I paid attention to in practice and then having them translate to the game, right? Providing you as a viewer context by saying, okay, yesterday in practice, Doc Rivers worked on this scheme to stop LeBron James. One of the reasons why this scheme is not working today in the game is because LeBron has done A, B, C, D, and a, B, C, and D, okay? Breaking down to you guys, giving you context on what the defense is trying to do, and then telling you why the offense is actually prevailing during the game. 
Those are some of the critical components to breaking down basketball, understanding schemes and also understanding rhythms, right? Understanding what tendencies are, what players like to do. And that only comes by watching a countless amounts of hours of games of basketball, of individual players. You know, back in, you guys can't see it, but behind me, literally, I always got NBA League Pass going. I'm always downloading information. And that's so important to understand what are trends, which guys are playing well, which guys aren't playing well. How do you dig yourself out of a hole? How do you get yourself out of a funk? And then also for guys who are hot, how do you sustain being hot? Or maybe you're not finding your swagger offensively. Maybe you're somewhat stagnant. You know, what are different stories? What are beat writers? Beat writers are whenever you see people after a game, when LeBron James comes into the Laker locker room, you see the press conferences that we show on SportsCenter. You see 40 mics around him, right? Everybody has a mic in here. Hey, LeBron, I have this question for you. Hey, LeBron, I have that question for you. Hey, I'm asking this, right? So individuals get paid to cover that team specifically. So what you end up doing is before you even get to the practice, before the day of the game, I literally take three to four hours and I read all the beat writers, mostly leading up to the game, maybe a week or two weeks of reports of all the games and all their breakdowns leading up to the game. After I do that, I compile my own list. I have every player, say Los Angeles Lakers, LeBron James, JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, Contavious Caldwell-Pope, Ray John Rondo, Alex Caruso, AKA the bald ego, uh, bald ego, all these guys. And I have all these notes underneath their name. After that, then I go back to all the individual, the, their games, right? Five games. I go back five games. I watch each game. And then I take the box score after each game. I add those nuggets, right? What are trends leading into my game? Then I go to the location. I go to LA. I spend time with Doc Rivers. I spend time with Frank Vogel. I watch the Clippers practice. I get their schemes offensively and defensively. I speak to some of their players. Hey, JaVale McGee, how's the ankle feel today? Will you be able to play 30 minutes? Maybe you only play 15 minutes. Okay, interesting. When I see you go down and grab your ankle in the game, well, guys, let me tell you why. Two games ago, he rolled his ankle. My job to tell you why, provide context, all right? Hey, this team just traveled off a plane. They're playing back-to-back -back games, two games in two days. Hey, they just played this game in Utah. Now they're coming back to LA. This is maybe why they're tired, or they played a game in Denver, the altitude. Right? Playing a game in Denver is drastically different than playing a game in Los Angeles. But you need to play in these arenas. You need to spend time with these coaches and these players and understand context by doing your due diligence to give me the full story. The full story. It's not my job just to say, well, LeBron James had 45 and this was incredible. Let me tell you all the reasons why it was incredible. It's my job to tell you why LeBron James was prepared mentally and psychologically on how he got those 45 points. Okay, perfect. Next slide. Let's go, Brian. Here we go. This is really good stuff. Okay, what do analysts look for when you see, right? So Steph Curry hits a three. Giannis gets an open dunk. LeBron James with the block. Let's go through all these. Steph with the three, okay, three-point shot. Giannis dunk and LeBron James with the block. Okay, come on out, Brian. So this is very important, guys. So a lot of times you guys will see highlights on IG, on Snap of, Steph Curry coming down and taking a, a really deep three, right? Maybe um, we can't get highlights, but he takes a couple steps over half court, launches up a shot. So let me tell you a couple of things I look for with Steph Curry. So number one, Steph Curry is a dual threat. I don't know if a lot of players, if you guys know what I mean by dual threat. A lot of players have tendencies where there's a pace dribble, right? So for me, there was a tendency with my game that my left hand, the way I dribbled the ball was my pace dribble, right? So most of the time when I shot the ball, I can shoot off both hands off the dribble. But when I was in a one-on-one -on -one situation, literally I would hit you with a hesitation. Either I was gonna go by you or I was gonna pretty much raise into a jump shot, right? Steph is a dual threat. He can do with both hands, his left and his right. But one of the things you should pay attention to that you won't get a chance to see as much when you're watching the game from home, but when you're on the court, you see it differently. If Steph is one of the best shooters in the game, not just because of his ability to make shots, but because of his eyes. Now, you're gonna ask me, Jay, what does that mean, his eyes? Steph has this ability to shoot the ball from anywhere on the court. But what he does before he shoots, he focuses his eyes on his target. So when he brings the ball over half court, sometimes you'll see him, right? And they'll have a pastry ball with both hands and they'll go like this. 
He'll look at the rim and he'll pause. So let me tell you what that does. When I when Steph Curry goes like this and he stops and he gives you a hesitation, he looks at the rim. A couple of things can happen. That could be a hesitation or it could be a shot. What does it force you to do as a defender? It forces you to, you lean in. Now, if you decide to lean in, he has you. You know why? Because defensively, you always want to stay on balance. You want to be upright. You want to be solid. When I lean, now all of a sudden I'm not on balance. He has me on a, on a, on a yo-yo. He can take me left. He can take me right because I'm leaning. I'm leaning towards him. His momentum is bringing himself towards me. I'm leaning towards him. So with his eyes, when he catches you like this, if he freezes you, he can pull up in your face. If you lean, he can cross you over and go this way. One dribble pull up. If you lean the opposite way, he can come back, he can put his shoulder into you and then cut you off. He may not be fast to sustain beating you without actually cutting you off. So by the time you turn around, he's going this, he's cutting into you, taking all of a sudden you're on the back end of the play. You're out of the picture and he can always lean forward and shoot. So know that when you watch Stephen Curry, right? Eyes. Number two about Stephen Curry, when he comes off screens, his footwork is impeccable. So when he comes off the screen, the screen's coming down and he's looping around the screen on the right side of the court, he's already turning into his shot. His shoulders, if the screen's coming this way, he's already turning into his shot before he catches the ball. You know what that does? By the time he catches the ball, he's already into a shot. Think about a normal player. If I'm turning, I'm catching the ball here, I have to turn all the way into my shot and then I have to go up. What does that do? That gives the defender a lot more time to catch up and to retreat to block my shot, okay? Especially if the defender's trailing me on screens. Steph, by the time he catches the ball, his shoulders are already turned towards his target. So think about the instantaneousness of that quick release, which you guys see all the time, is that thing's gone. It's gone before you even a chance to get there. So that's Stephen Curry. Eyes and footwork for Stephen Curry. For Giannis, a lot of people talk about his dunks. Oh, look how long he is. Do you know Giannis is, has one of the best footworks there is in all of basketball. Watch how many times Giannis Euro steps through traffic when he attacks. So one of the things we all know Giannis has to work on is his jump shooting ability, right? But when you watch Giannis in traffic, Giannis will, if a defender is coming to the right, Giannis will sidestep to the left, right? And then another defender maybe comes up, he'll sidestep back to the right. But when he sidesteps guys, right? I don't know if you guys know what a lot of Euro steps is. It's literally, it's like you're dancing with the ball. You get two steps. So when you go up for a layup, you go, Say I'm going up for right-handed layup. I go right foot, left foot, jump, right? Usually it's right foot, left foot in my stride. A Euro step is I can still take right foot, left foot, but I can take it towards the side. So I can step out here with my right and I can come back over here with my left. And then I can lay the ball up, right? One of the things Giannis does exceptionally well with his Euro step is he knows when to extend his arms and when not to extend his arms. Now, somebody's gonna ask, Jay, why is that so significant, right? A lot of times when you come through traffic, what do people do? They break down on their arms, right? It, if you don't know where the ball is going to be, there's going to be a tendency for you to foul me. So sometimes when I Euro step right, I can hold the ball over here. Sometimes when I Euro step back to left, I can hold the ball here or I can hold the ball here. He's so good at keeping the ball distance from his body, bringing it back and forth that allows him with his footwork to navigate through traffic to get those crazy dunks that you guys see in traffic. So that's him, LeBron James. He's one of the best there is ever to play this game. One of the things that you have to pay attention to with LeBron is his hands on the ball. Now, I know you're probably, once again, you're going to ask me, Jay, what do you mean, LeBron James in his hands, right? You guys see every time when LeBron makes a mistake, he goes, mm. he goes like this, right? Hands are so important, guys, right? Because for LeBron James, when he's going, first off, his head is always up. For a lot of you young guys on this call right now, well, I see a lot of you guys, you dribble like this. You're dribbling, you're going, you're going, or you're only looking at your defender. I'll tell you something. The better you get at basketball, LeBron James is one of the best there ever has been to do this, all right? I don't just see my man. I see the entire floor. I see where everybody is positioned. And also, it's like a quarterback. LeBron James is able to deliver passes where you should be, not exactly where you are. So an example of this, what I mean, is there a lot of times on fast breaks where LeBron James will have somebody riding him on his left shoulder and he's dribbling the ball. The ability to take the ball off the dribble, and you'll see LeBron sometimes. I don't know if you guys watched the football game last night, but Pat Patrick Mahomes 
did this. He threw, he was looking this way and he threw a pass that way, right? So one of the things that LeBron is so good is right now I can still see you, but I'm not even talking to you. I'm, I'm talking to you. I can't see you see you, but I can still see you, right? I can see if Brian changes the slide. I can see what colors of the slide are. I can see my light all the way over there in the corner. It's because you learn how to train yourself to see the whole floor, while also kind of throwing a, a twist to your defender because I'm looking this way, but I'm actually looking that way. So LeBron James, his hand-eye coordination to bring the ball and to see it and just deliver it off the dribble, right? Somebody's like, hey, Jay, catch this. Boom, I'm looking this way, but I caught it. Boom, I'm looking this way, I can caught it. He's been able to do this, and this is an innate skill. A lot of people do not have it, but the ability to see that when you're actually on the floor and see how quick his hands are and how he can grab a ball and throw it. There are a lot of times, sometimes he can catch a pass. He'll catch it with one hand and throw it off the pass. A lot of times you catch something, you go, right? And then you throw it. LeBron will just catch it out of the air and then throw it because he's already thinking plays ahead, telling you where you should be. So those are things for you guys to pay attention to when you watch Steph Curry, Think about the shoulders, the footwork, the eyes with the hesitation. When you think about Giannis, think about the footwork, think about Euro stepping through traffic, but extending the ball, bringing the ball back in. And then when you think about LeBron James, when you watch him play, especially tomorrow night against his zone, watch how his passing ability, watch how he can quickly catch the ball, throw it. Watch how he's not always looking at his passes, but he has a great feel for where players should be. I think those are incredible, important things for you to pay attention to. Next slide, Brian. All right, I think it's really cool. So I wanna ask you guys this question. What do you guys think Jalen, Maria, Paul, and I do between tip-off and halftime? Take some time, you can answer the question. Give me some of your best stuff. Watch the game, yes, we're, we're watching the game, okay. Thinking about what we want to say at halftime, very good, we are. We're thinking about what we want to say at halftime. Okay, paying attention to the analytics of the game, yes. Talking to each other, yes, about what we see, yes. To a slight degree, I don't want to tell them everything I'm going to say. I want there to be an element of surprise to a degree. But guys, the thing that we mostly pay attention to in the game is all the things I just described to you. So we'll go back to it. Boston versus the Miami Heat, okay? One of the things that Bam Adebayo said, who is the starting five, even though he's really not a five for the Heat, is that... He had to play better. So one of the things you saw since they play a lot of zone, they play, you know, Boston actually leads the NBA in pick and rolls is Bam Adebayo had to be up higher on a lot of these screens. So in the game that they lost prior, he was really sitting back and they call this center field. So the screen's happening up there with you guys, right? Bam was back here. And one of the things that happened when the screen came off the screen up there, that was Kimball Walker, Jason Tatum, when their player set the screen, Bam was so far back that guys would come off and they would be able to score. They'd be able to shoot a mid-range jump shot, be able to shoot threes. That's why you saw them get so hot. Well, one of the adjustments that Eric Spolster made in that game that they won the last game is Bam was up on the screen being active with his hands. So now all of a sudden, Bam being more active in that, it didn't leave as many open shots. And it forced that player who was coming off the screen, whether that be Jalen Brown, Jay Crowder, Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, now, all of a sudden, they had to make a decision. What, you know, if Daniel Tice is rolling towards the basket, do I give the ball to Daniel Tice? Which most of the time they didn't. They forced Daniel Tice to make a lot of plays. But that's a win for Eric Spolstra in the Miami Heat because I'd much rather have Daniel Tice or in his canter making plays with the ball than having Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Kimball Walker. I want to get the ball out of their hands, right? So we're looking at schemes. Oh, wait, how's Miami guarding the pick and roll? Oh, the guy's not sitting center field this game. Oh, he's actually showing on the screen. Oh, they're actually blitzing the screen. That means trapping. Oh, they're actually downing a screen. What does downing mean, right? These are all basketball terminologies that you guys will learn how to use. So if there's a side pick and roll, right? Say I'm playing on the side. The sideline is over here, okay? I'm playing my man here. He's on the side. What it means to down a pick and roll is if the screen's coming this way, I'm going to go so high on the screen, I'm not going to allow you to use the screen. I'm going to force you to stay on this side of the court. And my big, who's guarding the guy setting the screen, is waiting for you around the basket. So I'm going to funnel you in. I'm limiting how much room you have to dance with the ball. I'm only making you stay on the right side of the court, and I'm only giving you one way to go. You're not going to beat me over the screen. You're only going to beat me towards my man where I have help. Right? So those tendencies in which you see sometimes 
Those are different schemes. And it's my job watching the game to tell you why Jason Tatum didn't score in the first half of game five, right? To tell you why Jason Tatum exploded for 28 points in the second half, because all of a sudden the Boston Celtics were attacking the rim way more than just settling for jump shots in which they did the entire first half when Miami was playing their two, three matchup zone. So it's my job to all of a sudden tell you the why. Guys, it's so important to be an analyst. It's your job to paint a colorful picture of why this happened. Okay, next slide. Jay, you the Brian James. No more slides. There's no you more the slides. James. We had more, and uh, they were going to break down, you know, Steph and LeBron, and they LeBron James this and thought, Sorry, you know, missed, 10 plays one. ahead. No, that's why you do what you do. So, uh, which is actually perfect because uh, we've had a ton of great questions coming in. So, um, I think this is great. But yeah, I've heard the, uh, the point guard thinking, you know, where's the game going to be? You, uh, you threw the ball where the game was going to be in there. So, um, huge thanks. And, uh, you know, I do, I do find that, you know, everything you said, watching things like they're eyes their hands you and i talked a little bit before like i worked for the detroit pistons for a couple of years i got to go to a lot of games and when you take games and watch like hey i'm not even gonna watch the ball i'm gonna watch what's happening over here it is you get a whole new appreciation so thanks for uh, for turning everybody on to that to be able to see like i'm just gonna watch you know you know who's setting the screens over there and who's doing it and you learn a lot um hey one big question uh, i know i had it and i saw a couple other people type it in uh while we were going through you mentioned you know interviewing uh you know coaches and players the day before the game um do you ever get a sense that maybe they're lying to you so that they get an advantage in the game I wouldn't pet, put it past like Popovich or somebody but how uh do you uh, think they ever game you to uh to, to get an advantage well I, I I don't know because I don't really know how that will provide them an advantage it's not like while these teams are playing they're listening to me doing the broadcast right um you know it, it's a lot of times just because I tell you that we're we're trying to accomplish this it's also my job to have, if 1A doesn't work, I have to have 1B ready. I have to have 1C ready. I have to have 1D ready. I have to have 1E ready. I have to have 1F ready, right? There's all these different layers of the game plan, these nuances, that there's not enough time in a day for you to tell me exactly what you have to do. So a lot of it is how do you devise a scheme that you can change on the fly? And the more I keep you guessing offensively about how I'm guarding you is the more I'm being disruptive and how I'm throwing you off your cadence, your rhythm. Now, if I guard you man-to-man one position, and I guard you two-three zone, then I guard you a box of one, and then I come back to a three-two matchup zone, you're like, wait, I just saw four different defenses and four different possessions, and uh, you know, by the time it takes me a second to realize what you're in, think about it, I'm at 16 or 17 seconds on the shot clock, all right? So all of a sudden, then we have to press our offense a lot more, and it, our set may actually be conducive towards what defensive scheme you're in if you've been able to change it. So a lot of it is how quickly you can change your scheme and how quickly you can keep people adjusting. Excellent. Good, good point. All right. That's um, yeah, I was, I was wondering about that. I think some others were too. Hey, before we get all the way into Q and a, let's do one more, but then we want to take a break from the self. I forgot we usually do the selfie right before Q and a, but uh, we're, we're so many plays ahead, Jay, so many plays ahead. we're playing, playing fast with the, uh, the shot clock here. So um, get those cameras ready uh, after this next question, we'll give you guys a chance to, uh, to take that picture to, uh, to enter to win. Um, one question that came in, I thought was just kind of funny. You're talking about an analyst, but you know, even mentioned, you know, back in the back of the day, Carl Malone. And you're more recent than that. A um, few people wanted to know a little bit about your playing career, and I think one of my favorites was, "What is your favorite play of your own playing career?" Huh. My favorite play. I have I have a lot of plays. I think one of my favorite moments was recognizing that I was not as fast as Allen Iverson, and I was pretty darn fast. I was pretty fast and I was pretty strong, but I think just guarding him, um, you know, around that time, seeing how he was able to cover so much ground, you know, AI was six one six two, maybe about 175 pounds, 180 pounds. So, you know, he would go to the free throw line, probably an average of 11 to 12 times a game, like 11 to 12 times a game. That's a lot. He got a lot of his points from the free throw line. So, you know, if you hit him with the elbow, if he came into your body, you, you bulked up like this. He actually would fall down. It was a legitimate fall. He would go to the free throw line, two free throws. And all of a sudden you look up and you're like, how does AI have 36 points? You're like, well, he made 14 free throws, right? So I, realistically, he just scored 22 points, but that's how it actually works out. So I would say AI. I'd also say, you know, a guy who was like my mentor uh, when I was playing was Kobe Bryant. So going against Kobe 
for me, I think that one game had like 25, 26, because they were playing the triangle. We played the triangle. Uh, but just recognizing that he was 6'6", six, six, and he was, you know, I played against him and Michael Jordan. So Jordan was 40 years old when I played against him in the last year before retirement. And all the moves that Jordan did against me, Kobe was just doing those same moves, but faster and stronger. So it actually gave me appreciation. I'm like, Jordan's doing this against me, and he's 40 years old. And they're still kind of working, but Kobe's doing it against me and he's, you know, 27 years old and he's destroying me. Wow, I need, I need a lot of work on my game. Uh, so I would probably say that, those two, and then definitely, you know, I, I made the rookie game, rookie all-star game. So getting a chance to practice with the all-stars and hang out with KG and Paul Pierce, who I do NBA countdown with, and Jason Kidd and Ray Allen and, you know, LeBron James came to a practice when we were playing against Cleveland when he was like 15 years old. And I'm like, who's this six, six dude at 15 years old standing on the side. Uh, so I, I think I've had a chance to see so much over my time. There, there's a lot of favorite times, not just one. I also love how the, the consummate analyst, right? All of your favorite plays are appreciating someone else's game. You know, although well, maybe getting 25 or 26 against them. But uh, I love that answer. While we've got you smiling in uh, in time to reminisce, all right, everybody, it's your chance to take a picture with Jay. Uh, he's nostalgic. He's smiling. He's, uh, he's you know, enjoying all that. So let's go uh, about 30 or 40 seconds. Jay, if you want to take it away, everybody, let's, uh, let's get those pictures with Jay. Sure. I got you guys. Here we go. I'm gonna bring this into it too, so you guys can. I didn't do this last one, but all right, I'm bringing this big boy into it. How about that? Here we go. All right. Cheese. <laughs> Perfect. Okay put this big boy back okay, all right you. thank you and for everyone while, while jay's putting that back if you put that on instagram tag jay williams tag varsity tutors you'll be entered to win an autographed basketball on our way out tonight we'll make sure we have all the instructions up there for you so um you can analyze those and uh, and get those up there so um all right another question a lot of people want to know um who's your favorite team and uh, that actually leads me to a question that i think i think broadcasters kind of like so let me open that one up um one, do you have a favorite team you watch? But also, I think every fan assumes that every analyst is biased against their team and for their <laughs> rival, right? So how do you respond when people say, like, oh, Jay, you're so biased against, you know, the Knicks, the Spurs, the whoever, um, unless you do have a favorite team and you just want to say what your bias is right now? No, you know, like, uh, my favorite team is the team that plays well enough to win. It really is. Uh, obviously I have affiliation for Chicago. I always want the best for Chicago. That's where I got drafted. Uh, I did grow up uh, a New Jersey Nets fan. So I'm a fan of the Brooklyn Nets, but you know, I stopped really caring what a lot of people thought a long time ago, Brian, I will say this. One of the, one of the things about my job that you start to recognize when you try to be objective and you try to be real about your opinion is that, you know, people are going to dislike and people are going to like what you say. There's nothing you can do about it. I found this out, especially when I was doing a lot of college basketball back in the day. If I said something objective or something critical about Duke, I was a hater. I should have had my jersey burned. I should never have my jersey retired there. I was a traitor. I'm trying too hard to be objective. You're, you're, you're overstepping your territory. But then when I would say something that would praise Duke if they would do something well, of course you would. You're a homer. Uh, you love your team. There's nothing you wouldn't do for your team. So you're kind of darned if you do, you're darned if you don't. So for me, I just tell you how I see it. Um, you may, I'm actually not going to engage you if you say something like that to me. Now, if you want to actually talk basketball and talk schemes with me and tell me why you disagree with my comment, I will engage with you. But the people that just say things like, oh, you, that's your favorite team. And of course you're going to say that. Now, you know, look, if I, if I root for KD, like I, I, I know Kevin Durant, I want Kevin Durant to be successful. But I also have gotten a lot of arguments with Kevin Durant about when I say LeBron James is the greatest player of all time, right? But I learned not to care uh, to a degree of what a lot of guys think because I have to give my unfiltered, raw opinion. But it doesn't mean I can't have conversations with them. And the way I say my opinion is very important. And I think, Brian, there's the biggest takeaway that we talk about breaking down the game. That's what I will say to everybody. I, I do not talk politics right now, but we have a presidential debate tonight. 
how you speak and how you communicate is very important. So when I say something critical about a player, one of the things that people don't tell you about my job is that it's easy when I'm in a studio. Well, this guy should have did this and I can't believe that. And you have some of these people that call people morons and name calling and things of that sort. That's not me because I have to see these people. So I can sit there and say, you know, LeBron James. And I got into a little thing the other day because I was like, LeBron James, you know, was similar to Scottie Pippen back in the day when he came, left Cleveland, went to Miami, played with D-Way's team at first. He was still the better player. And then he obviously he took the mantle, took the torch. LeBron James then responded to me. I then responded to LeBron James. But I said it in a way that he may have disagreed, but I know I'm going to see LeBron James. And I know I'm going to spend time with LeBron James. So that's very important, guys. How you say something is imperative, especially if you want to have relationships with players so they can continue to tell you what is actually happening in the game. That's the most important part. A lot of people just talk for the sake of talking. My thing is I like to talk with insight. And you only get that insight by having relationships to actually communicate what is actually going on. So I just wanted to say that. Awesome. I like that. And you mentioned that in that first class too, that, you know, you need to be thoughtful about not just today's comment, but you know, what does that do in the future? And, uh, and, and, you know, kind of, you know, keep, keep open mind about maybe you're wrong in this one. So, you know, support it and, and be open. So. And Brian, and owning when you're wrong, like going to a guy like, you know, LeBron, okay, maybe I, I could have said that better. You're right. And that's okay. Right. It's it, nobody, nobody's batting a thousand here. Like everybody's trying to, as long as you show people that you're trying your hardest to empathize and to relate, they can disagree with your opinion, but they can also respect the opinion that they disagree with. Also a really good point. Yeah. The number of hours a day that you talk about sports, you're bound to be wrong at one point or another. And so exactly. thoughtfulness and, uh, and, and flexibility or being willing to admit you're wrong is, uh, is pretty big. So um, that's actually, that's the kind of point they, uh, one of my favorite questions here and it's big. So, so think about it, but that's kind of what a mentor would tell you. And uh, a lot of kids were like, Oh my, you know, Kobe was your mentor. Uh, one of my favorites here is uh, how do you get someone to mentor you if you've got, you know, someone you look up for, or you kind of, you know, it seems like everybody has someone help pave the way for them. Um, what's your advice for somebody who, you know, wants to have a, a mentor to teach them some of those lessons? Yeah. So I, I'll tell you about Kobe, a quick story that I've said multiple times. Um, you know, we were playing the Lakers. This is back when they were the championship Lakers. And I, w I really wasn't playing well. Uh, I was getting distracted with off the court scenarios. And I, I had a conversation with myself and Coach K a, a, a couple of days before that said, you know, I was going to recommit myself to getting back in the gym, staying in the gym, really just trying to find my groove. So one of the ways I did that is I got to the gym before games, the day of the game, and made a mandatory 300 made shots. I made 300 made shots. So sometimes you're making 300 made shots, you're shooting 450, 500 shots, right, depending upon where you're shooting from and things off the dribble. So game was at seven. Got to the gym around 1.30, got there, walked in the gym. I saw Kobe Bryant already working out. Sat there, sat on the bench, tied up my shoes. I was watching him work out for a minute because I was like, I was like, all right, that's really cool. That's Kobe. And I had a little bit of a relationship with him. Watch him work out. And that served as motivation for me to go work out, right? So I work out, spend an hour and a half on the court. Brian, everything's going well. I get done. I sit down on the bench. I unlace my shoes. And I look down and I still see Kobe Bryant working out at the same speed that he was working out when I first came in the gym for an hour. I'm like, what the heck? This, this guy is relentless. There's no way his legs are going to be dead. There's no way he's actually going to play. So I watch him for like another 10, 15 minutes. I'm like, all right, like I'm not going to be starstruck here. I'm cool. I'm done. I'm not going to give him any competitive advantage. So I walk out, I come back. It felt like that night Kobe had like 30 on us, right? So after the game, I found myself mesmerized trying to wonder like, why did he work out like that? So I found him after the game. Like I pursued him and I found him. I said, hey, man, look, I know we haven't had a lot of chances to spend time together. Um, but I wanted to ask you, like, why did you work out that hard? You know, when we were both working, like, why did you keep going for that long? And I'm like, it's a true look, like, why? And he was like, because I saw you come in the gym. And I want you to know that no matter how hard you work, you will never outwork me. And that was one of the realest lines that I've ever heard, because I really think that that line has, I've had to translate it to everything I do in my life. What you put in something is what you ultimately get out of something. And I think from that point on, I just kind of pursued him. I paid attention to what he said. I paid attention to how he operated. I asked him a ton of questions all the time. I was like that annoying little brother. 
And I never really took no for an answer, right? And I have people that reach out to me from time to time, whether it's like a direct message or like, hey, it's me on Twitter, uh, or they'll send ESPN a letter. And then it's one attempt. And I'm like, there's nothing I've done in my life that's been successful that's been one attempt. That's like me taking one jump shot. And it's like, all right, I expect to be in the NBA. That's not how the world works, right? Like you have to have a relentless attitude in order to be great at anything. You have to pursue it. So when you say that you want somebody to mentor you, I would say one of the things that's so important is make sure that they feel your passion for what you want. They can't feel you and they can't understand your why, right? Why are you built this way? Why is this so important to you? Then I have a wife. I have a kid. I have another kid on the way. I have a mom. I have a dad. I have jobs. You know, I have a lot going on in my life. You have to give me a reason to say, I'm going to give you 20 minutes of my life or 20 minutes of my day that is jam-packed to actually give you insight. And I only want to give that to people that want it just as bad as I do. You have to show that in your actions. That's that's an amazing answer. Yeah, you got to win their respect, show them that their investment of time in you is worth it. That's um, exactly. That's really good. Thank you, thank you. That's um, we had a few others actually. That one I, I don't want to end. That's actually a great one to end on. But the one, the number one question everybody has, I'm gonna try to frame it. And it will, you know, we'll try to hit you in stride to uh, to take the shot. So everybody wants to know who you think will win the finals, and you even mentioned uh, at the beginning that your I, job. I is told you, I told you, it's not my right? job to tell you who's yeah. going to win. So that, I want to ask you, this is a an small analyst. place in Vegas that tells you that, not me. <laughs> so let me ask you, this is an analyst instead, since we're trying to train yeah. everybody to watch the game. Everybody's going to be watching, you know, LeBron and Anthony Davis. Everybody's going to be watching, you know, uh, Tyler Hero, the three point shooters on Miami. What's something we should be watching that's not obvious. So as we're watching the next four to seven games, what are you looking at that the average fan might not be? So who did LeBron James win his first two world championships with? Miami. For you, Brian. Who was the head coach? Spolstra. Who's the he head coach better than anybody now? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So first, people need to understand context. Also, people need to understand why. So the last time that probably Pat Riley has seen LeBron James is when he flew all the way to Las Vegas to try to get LeBron to stay with the Miami Heat and not go back to the Cleveland Cavaliers. LeBron and those guys were watching the World Cup at the time. I don't think they gave Pat Riley, the full attention that he wanted. So just know that there's a lot of these types of backstories that go into this game. I will ultimately say this, Eric Spolcher is one of the best there is in the NBA at changing up defensive schemes. The Lakers are shooting 35% against zones in the bubble, but they have not been shooting that great throughout the entire season. So I think what you will see is that the Lakers have so much size between JaVale McGee, Dwight Howard, Anthony Davis, LeBron James, that they are tendency, they did against Denver, they dominated with points in the paint. Second chance points, rebounds, LeBron James attacking the rim, Anthony Davis punishing Jokic at times down low on the block. They had no answers for that. So I think what you'll see is whenever Miami plays, they'll probably end up playing zone. So whenever LeBron James drives, he's going to see two to three defenders. Whenever AD tries to post up on the block, he's going to see two defenders. So they're going to try to get the Lakers to settle to take a lot of jump shots. The Lakers will have to win the world championship by shooting the ball from the outside or trying to find a way to rebound over the smaller individuals who will continuously pack the paint for the Miami Heat. Um, but AD and LeBron need to be incredible. And guys like Contavious Colwood Pope, Rajon Rondo, Danny Green, they all need to shoot the ball pretty well from the outside for the Lakers to win it. All right. I am now ready to watch the NBA finals like an analyst in a way I wasn't an hour ago. So um, hopefully everybody else is feeling the, uh, the same way. So um, a huge thanks to, uh, to Jay for all of his insight and wisdom. I, I love that um, even though this class is done, we'll get to see you basically every other night for the next week or two. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that. For anyone who uh, is inspired and, and looking at like wanting to be more of a broadcaster and analyst, uh, remember we've got Jay's Broadcasting Brilliance collection with all kinds of exciting classes. He mentioned there's a debate tonight. There's some debate classes there in case you ever have to debate um, Stephen A. Smith or, uh, or Jay mm -hmm. himself at some point. So um, check us out at varsitytutors.com for more classes. Jay, any parting thoughts on the way out before we give him the Instagram instructions? Just make sure that your passion comes through. Make sure your passion comes through whatever you do. People can see that. They can feel that. That's important. 
Perfect. Great advice. Um, you've shown us that passion for uh, for helping students, for uh, NBA analysis and all of that. So um, a huge thanks. Best of luck to uh, to everyone with, uh, with your broadcast career and Jay Moore immediately. Uh, best of luck with the finals. Huge thanks to everyone. And uh, we'll see you back at varsitytutors.com pretty soon. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Bye.